This video is brought to you by Knowledge at the Australian School of Business. For more information, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au. If you believed the film The Matrix and The Lawn Merman, then within a few years we'll be living in a virtual world where computers could create an artificial reality and where we could see anything in three dimensions as if it was there. The implications for business, manufacturing and the individual would be huge. Car makers, for example, they could develop a car without ever having to weld steel again. We could control any plant virtually and there'd be huge productivity gains. Professor Stephen Barley is from the Department of Management Science and Engineering at Stanford University. He's written extensively on the impact of new technologies at work. He's here at the Australian School of Business to give a seminar on the lure of the virtual. So, Stephen, let's start with those virtual worlds. What do we actually mean when we're talking about something being virtual? Well, virtual is a concept that's been around for quite a while, going back really to the roots of computer science. There's been a, a long-standing dream, I guess, that through computers we could begin to do things with computers that we normally would have done in real life. A virtual world is where you're going to operate on something that has a referent in the real world, uh, either through a digital interface or entirely within a digital interface. And the dream is that we could eventually dispense with the real life and do whatever it is we're talking about entirely within the computer. This kind of thinking reaches its zenith in science fiction with movies like The Matrix, Inception. But significant steps towards virtuality have been taken over the last 15 to 25 years. Probably the most familiar are video games. Some of them are now highly, highly realistic. And technologies like video games are now used to train policemen, to use to train soldiers. So this kind of technology is moving into uh, the work world. Probably the most commonly experienced virtual uh, technology is a virtual team where what you do is communicate using computer-based technologies to people on a team doing a job that you may have never met face-to-face. -face. There's other kinds of virtual technologies that allow us to control physical objects from a distance. Some surgical procedures now are now entirely done through video computer technologies where a surgeon in a distant place can actually operate on you in another place or uh, drone aircraft are another example. Uh, probably the most sophisticated use in a workplace are simulation technologies, where instead of doing work on physical objects, you simulate it in the computer, as you might do in the, in the automobile industry, simulated crash testing. So instead of running real cars into real walls, you'll run simulated cars into simulated walls, and you'll study the processes of how forces move through the physical body of the car. And people who are developing the latest new right. cars, obviously they've been investing a lot of time and money in developing right. these tools. That means that they don't actually have to create a car from scratch and weld steel together. Surely there are dangers there because you get divorced from the, working right. with the, the material. Well, one of the biggest problems with simulation technology is the failure to recognize that you always need to validate the models you're working against against the real world. Failure to continually do that leads you to the problem that we talk, I've talked about today, the lure of the virtual, right, where people assume that we can dispense with the physical, perhaps because of cost concerns or perhaps because labor is cheaper or whatever, right? Most engineers know that this is not a viable approach. Most of the engineering literature is full of complaints about management who uh, assume that one doesn't can dispense with the physical phenomenon entirely. Most engineers know that that's foolish. You, you not only need to make sure your math is right, but you need to make sure that the way you put your equations together actually do, in fact, emulate the real world. So there needs to be an iteration between model building and then looking at the physical reality and, like, for example, a real car test and to try to understand whether or not your, your model car, your, your computational car, is performing within your simulation the way a real car would. 
if it's not, you have a problem because you don't, you know, you might make a mistake in designing a car that would make it more dangerous, for example. Um, maybe an airbag would not deploy properly because you forgot a detail that you didn't put in your model. So this need to actually play off against the real world is crucial for this kind of stuff. I, I don't know, in your research, you've actually got some anecdotes of where you've been talking to these people who've been working on the car models, and they've got so far away from the reality that they've just kind of assumed that it would work. Right, well, the, in this particular study, we studied the automobile company that decided it wanted to offshore parts of the simulation analysis to India. Assuming that there were highly trained in, uh, en engineers in India that you didn't have to pay as much and so on and so forth, then they're right. They, those engineers are well trained. But India is not, that's not a car culture, right? So you and I have an everyday understanding of automobiles that most Indian engineers don't have because automobiles are not as widely spread. They would make design decisions that you and I would never make, like, for example, using a mirror function in a piece of software that winds up putting two gas intake pipes in a car, right? We know just from general experience with cars that they only have one. Uh, and you also must have an element of trust there as well. The people within a company that are operating with these simulators must surely uh, trust one another to get it right. But if we're operating virtually, you get that distancing as well. Right. Well, when you offshore a virtual simulation, you, you really are putting together two kinds of virtuality. You're putting together a virtuality in the simulation itself, where you're divorcing your analysis from the physical reality. At the same time, you're separating people in distance and time and space, where you're interacting really with uh, uh, just indices of people. And we know that Distributed teams are plagued by problems of communication and coordination. So if you add problems of communication and coordination on top of problems of not being able to validate your models, you've made it more difficult to discover your mistakes. So how can you solve some of these problems, particularly if having virtual teams that may never ever meet face to face? It really is just an email address you're communicating with. How can you build up trust there and ensure that you've got that communication? Well, this is very difficult. Um, most people who study this believe that there must be actual some kind of face-to-face -face contact that takes place often at the beginning of the project, right? The more complicated the work, the more important this becomes. Uh, we've also got another type of virtual world in terms of remote access, people being very distant right. in, in a right. sealed control room where all right. they see are the machines right. probably on monitors and talk right. to the computers. Are we in danger there of just losing all the innate abilities that uh, people have built up over many years in terms of dealing with the materials? Uh, I don't know that we're in danger of losing that, but uh, the problem is how do you take people who have learned to work with a production process in a very sensory, sensory motor kind of way and lead them to think more analytically about this process. So remote control requires a more analytic engagement with a production process than typical physical and sensory engagement. And it's challenging. It's challenging for workers who shift to this way of working because they have not historically worked that way. And if operators actually do learn how to do this, they learn how to use data, they use to an analyze data to make decisions about production processes, then they essentially encroach upon the historic job of the middle manager. So the middle manager becomes threatened. So how can we solve these problems? Well, part of it will take care of itself as young people come along. You know, they've grown up in a world where th this is more prevalent, right? Part of the problem, however, may not go away because what we've discovered in our series of research that we've done for years is that as these jobs become more intellectual, uh, you would expect that they would, members of these occupations, or would gain more respect in the workplace. Maybe their salaries would go up. This typically does not happen. What usually happens is their skills get upgraded and the status structure gets adjusted back to what it was so that they now, despite the fact that they have higher skills, they're still at the bottom of the ladder. They still don't get respect, blah, blah, blah. But I'm assuming that we will dramatically increase productivity. After all, we've got tools here that even a decade or so ago we couldn't have dreamt of. Is there actually that productivity increase? Well, productivity assumes either you're going to get more per unit time or it's going to cost you less, right? Most 
firms experience an increase in cost. Communication problems increase costs. Rework increase costs, right? So the initial calculus, which is based on wage rates and other simple things like that, suggests that if it doesn't increase productivity, at least it should cost us less to get the same thing, right? But in reality, what's usually missed are the unintended consequences of these technologies, which actually require expenditures, effort, additional work to counterbalance. So quite often, right, no money is saved at all. And in many cases, more money is spent than you would have spent to begin with, right? So maybe productivity is not always the right way to think about it. Maybe you get greater accuracy. Uh, maybe you get quicker turnaround times. And to give a good example, right? Studying automobile crashes virtually versus physically it costs half a million dollars to build a prototype automobile that you can crash into a wall once, right? With a simulated car, you can crash it many, many times, change the nature of the barriers that the car is crashing into, and you know how to build a new car, right? So in that sense, it saves you a lot of time, saves you a lot of money, you get more data. On the other hand, if you don't pay attention to the adequacy or the validity of the models that you're using, you can make really serious mistakes. So it's a complicated situation where you may gain on one hand and lose on the other. So is, is there anything in particular that you uh, would warn people to look out for? The primary thing that one needs to worry about when operating virtually is the assumption that physical, whether it's an encounter with an individual or the ability to examine a physical object that you're simulating, is the sense that you can actually dispense with this stuff and still have uh, an effective process be it a group process or a production process. Professor Stephen Barley, thank you very much. You're welcome. For more business news and analysis from Knowledge at the Australian School of Business, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au.